Welcome to church, everybody. If you're joining us online, we're so glad you're here. I mentioned earlier that you are currently joining us at our Mount Pleasant weekend away at Rockridge Canyon in Princeton, BC. Let's say hello, everybody. Let's greet our online community. We're so glad you're here. <laughs> We've been having a beautiful time just of worship, of connection with God, of connection with each other. I'm glad you could join us for church this morning. And if you're new and you're joining us online, if you go to tenth.ca forward slash hello, you can fill out a connect card. We'd love to connect with you when we're back from Princeton, back in Vancouver. I look forward to connecting with you then. If you're also joining us online, you're going to join us for our whole service, including communion, so you can grab some bread and juice at home and prepare for that. We're glad you're here. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for this sacred space. And in fact, because you are holy, wherever we are is sacred. In our living rooms, maybe if we're listening to the audio in a car, or if we're watching live here in Rockridge, you are holy. You are worthy of our praise. So our hearts are full with gratitude for who you are, God. We thank you for your great love for us. Amen.
for you. As you sing the truth of the Father's great love about who we are in Him. That we find hope, we find peace, we find truth only in Him. Good morning. My name is Mark Buchanan. For those of you online, best way to introduce myself is I think I'm a friend of 10th Church. I, I feel very much at home among you. And indeed, some of the, the, the people dearest to me on this earth are, are Ken and Sekiko and Joey. So I so value and am so thankful for your friendship. Oh, you're a good, good father. <laughs> the Creo group, I, I derive so much pleasure, joy, just watching you worship. Um, I feel very good about the future because of the faith I see in people your age, it gives me, it gives me um, tremendous hope that what God's got ahead is very good. So thanks for being front and center. Twenty ten was my very first trip to Bolivia. Went back a few times, but twenty ten and a friend living in the beautiful city of Cochabamba, Bolivia. And until I arrived there, I had no idea that towering over the city on a high ridge above the city 
is a statue of Jesus, arms spread wide, that is a perfect replica of the Christ Redeemer statue that's in, more famously, in Rio de Janeiro, with this one exception, the Christos de la Concordia, the Christ of unity in Cochabamba, is one meter taller. Uh, I guess there's a little rivalry going on there. But I was visiting my friend, I was stunned at this gorgeous, uh, glowing, welcoming, beautiful, winsome, Christ standing above the city, his arms spread wide, as if to say, come unto me, all you who are heavy and weary, and I'll give you rest. After I'd done a few things in the city, my friend one day said to me, I think it was a Sabbath, I think it was a Sunday, do you want to go up to the Christos de la Concordia? I did, of course, and we take this back road, winding hairpins, we get up. I'm running out of the car just to get to the feet of Jesus. I forgot it's like 8,000 feet elevation, so I'm pretty winded and I'm not in the best shape anyhow. I'm stunned. Stunned standing there. I, I'm having a, a profound religious experience looking at a statue. And then my friend says the most remarkable thing, do you want to go in? <laughs> I, y y we can go in? <laughs> yeah, do you want to go in? Yes. I, I, I'm almost hyperventilating from excitement. We go over and there's a little tiny door, it's like a hobbit door. Like even for me, short, it's, I have to, you know, I have to stoop. Uh, and, and, and we go to the hobbit door and it's locked, padlocked. And I consider the ethics of breaking into Jesus. But uh, there's no getting past this great big padlock and he won't let me vandalize it. And so um, I did not know this was not just a bucket list item, but this was kind of like a have to do it for my soul thing. And I'm walking away now crushed that I didn't get to go inside the hobbit door and inside the statue of Jesus. By the providence of God, two years later, I'm back in Cochabamba. My friend says, do you want to go back up to the Christus de la Concordia? And of course I do. Uh, trembling, trembling, trembling. Will we get in? We go up again, I run up again, I'm winded again, stand at the feet again. But the thing I want most is to go inside. And we go down to the little hobbit door and it's unlocked. And so we go in and inside the statue are spiral iron steps going up, 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 up. And about every 10 feet or so is a scaffolding of planks. And you can stand on those. And it turns out, I didn't realize from looking from the outside, but from the inside it's so obvious, front and back, both sides of the body of the statue, front and back, are little about face-sized portholes that you can look out onto the surrounding landscape around you. So I would go up, up, you know, the 10 feet, get in the platform, look out all four. I'd go up the next, look out all four. I kept doing that. It's a, like a 90-foot high statue, so there's a lot of steps, there's a lot of platforms. Finally, I got to the last platform, and it's right here. It's right at heart level. And I think by design, they've, they've, they've positioned the last platform where you look out really from that, the chest area of Jesus. I, I kind of knew uh, something was about to happen for me, so I went and I looked at through every porthole but this one first. I, right side of the chest, I went through the back, looked out, and then I stepped up to the heart of Jesus. 
And I looked out, and to my astonishment, I don't know if this was one of those architectural kind of you know, a break things that nobody anticipated, and yet it happened, or they had planned this all along. But they have positioned the statue that when you stand only in that place of the heart of Jesus, you can see the entire city of Cochabamba spread out before you. And the revelation that I had been sensing God was going to give me dropped. That my whole existence since I came to faith at age 21 has been a movement into the very presence of God, not just standing before him at his feet, that's a glorious, beautiful thing, but actually the invitation to come in, come in to the very life of Jesus. Jesus is not so much inviting or asking you to invite him into your life, he's inviting you into his. <laughs> And the very heart of the relationship that he wants, that I had been moving toward, that I'm still moving toward, is that I see everything. I see everything. I see the city I live in. I see the people I live with and work with, the, 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 the people I love and the people I struggle to love. I see everything and everyone through the heart of Jesus. <laughs> Yesterday, and I'll sum it up briefly for those online. I did talk about the passage in Matthew 11, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Jesus, I think, if he has a posture, as he says it, the only posture I can imagine is this. Both cruciform and come into my arms. And I talked about the, the God of welcome. In fact, I had people, if those who are here will remember, those who are online, uh, to let you know what happened. I asked them to, if you had to capture all of the attributes of God into a single one, that as much as possible, that single attribute contained all the rest, what would you choose? And people went around, there's fantastic answers, but I. I said that there is a Christian ethicist by the name of Stanley Harwis who su suggests that the single attribute that captures best all of the other qualities of God is hospitality. Because he says, who else? Who else but God pursues even those who hate him, defy him, resist him, mock him, pursues them as far as he needs to pursue them as long as he needs to pursue them. Not so that he might punish them, but that he might woo them, adopt them, make them sons and daughters, and invite them back to his place to live and feast forever. And Harwood says that's the essence of divine hospitality. Don't you think it contains so much else? But I want to take it a step further in terms of the hospitality of God today, and I want to read a text that will be well known to many of you because it's not simply this come and be in my presence, it's this come and be in me. This is John 15, it's a bit lengthy, so do bear with me, I'll try to read it with meaning. These are words of Jesus sitting with his disciples as he's about to go and now show them the full extent of his love. He's done one version of that by washing his feet. Now he's going to give his life for them and us. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is a gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, abide in me, and I will abide in you. Live here, he's saying. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Well, as a father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now, abide in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will remain or abide in my love, just as if I, I have obeyed my father's commands and abide in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is that this, and my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command. I, I, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything, everything that I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love one another. And this hospitality of Jesus does say, come, come, be with me, be in my presence. But the deeper hospitality is stay. Come in and stay. Most of us in Western, grew up in Western um, culture, know about the three-day rule. It's, 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 it applies to fish and guests. Three-day rule is uh, after three days, you throw the fish out. After three days, you throw the guest out. <laughs> well, you just wish they would leave. Uh, even people we feel often very close with, it's a kind of a three-day rule in Western culture. <laughs> um, God doesn't know the three-day rule. I mean, other than in three days he rose to life. <laughs> he knows the forever and ever and ever rule. Would you come? Would you stay? Would you remain? Would you abide? Would you not leave? <laughs> Even as you go, would there be an abiding in your going? Would there be a sense of carrying the presence, the joy, the, the goodness, the, the love I have for you? Would, you? would you carry it everywhere? <laughs> and when you get worn thin, would you, would you come home and fill up again? That's a word that God actually uses in, in, in John 14, and John 14, 15, 16. 17 are all part of what's called the upper room discourse. And actually, John 14, 23, Jesus says, my father and I will make our home with you. Now, home, for some of us, is a very lovely, resonant idea. Um, such great associations with it. Maybe always have. Maybe from earliest childhood, we have treasured the idea of home. We just hear the word and something warms in us, but there's others, I'm sure, listening, not so. It's associated with pain, with uh, having to distort yourself, live a shadow version of yourself to survive, with the wrong kind of emotion all the time, the right kind of emotion being scorned, repressed, so, in the time I have, I, I want to talk from this passage, the home that God says, come, come, stay. There's no three-day rule. There's three things that really mark it out that I see in this passage, three things that if we've had a really good home life, 
uh, they're just a, a deeper, a, a, an infinite enhancement of the good, thing, good things we've known. And if we haven't, they are a remedy for the hard things we've known. Three things that really do characterize the Father's home that he makes with us. First is a bit surprising. Uh, there is a deep formation in the Father's home, but you're going to have to bear with me for the next four minutes. There's a pain in the Father's home, but it's not the pain of trauma. It's a pain of healing. The first thing Jesus says, if you come and live here, if you abide here, if you, if you come not just to me, but you enter in and we make our home together, uh, the first thing we're going to do is some pruning. <laughs> and I lived on Vancouver Island for many years and uh, became a, uh, an amateur orchardist. I mean, I just had one tree of everything. But I was just so happy to kind of have a yard and be able to plant pear trees and peach trees and plum trees and grapes and all that. Just an amateur orchardist. And the one thing I found out very quickly is that no tree actually bears fruit of any kind of sweetness, of any kind of succulence, of any kind of kind of robustness without some deep, deep pruning. Oh, it'll look like it's flourishing, but the fruit will be minimal. And I remember the first time I got this and I talked to an arborist and he instructed me on what to do. And uh, in the dead of winter, I went and I made those trees look dead. In fact, uh, my children and even my wife uh, were disgusted with how deeply I'd pruned those trees. That You've killed them, they said. <laughs> and I was um, an amateur orchardist, so I think I killed them. <laughs> what happened that spring and into the summer was breathtaking. Uh, the flourishing of those trees, the abundance of fruit that they produced that they hadn't up to that point, how sweet that fruit was. See, the, the pruning of the father is a kind of pain, but it's not a pain of trauma. Some of you have grown up in homes where it's just been the pain of wounds, terrible things said and terrible things done. And the father, the weird thing is the irony, the holy paradox is sometimes the deep hurts of life can only be healed by a, a, a kind of pain that isn't doubling down or, or somehow repeating or... Um, making more intense the trauma, but somehow it heals it. The, the best way I can illustrate this, two years ago, and, and Ken and Sekuko have been such great supporters of this ministry. My wife and I, in the middle of COVID, launched a ministry called New Story Community. It's second stage recovery for indigenous women who are coming out of addiction. And the women who come to our program, we've just done two years of it, um, Oh my goodness, the trauma, the complex layers and layers of trauma that they come with. We, we've learned that uh, most people, and certainly these women, don't use abuse substances because they want to get high. They want to feel normal. They just want to feel normal. And there's so much pain in their past, the only way they can feel halfway normal is to numb themselves. So they have pain, but they're not feeling pain when they show up. They're feeling nothing. They come into our program, and, and most of the women have been through multiple uh, um, times of treatment where they've gone for three weeks or whatever, and they've kind of been locked down, and their phone has been taken away, and they've got off the meth or the heroin or whatever it happens to be, their substance of choice, and they get clean, and usually within a week, it's usually actually within 24 hours after they're back out, they lapse again. And we watched the cycle, my wife and I, and thought, what if <laughs> our retirement plan was we went and lived in a community with um, these amazing, brave, deeply wounded women and we just, we actually made a home. And, it, and, the, and the 
mission statement of our ministry is we promote the flourishing of indigenous women in a place of safety, beauty, and community. And we didn't realize how much the safety mattered. And these women come and they're in so much pain, but they don't feel the pain. They've numbed the pain. And what happens over the seven months they're with us is in the first three to four months, they start to feel the pain. And God, by his spirit, and just uh, the, the, the amazing um, commitment of my wife walking day and day and day and with these beautiful women, guiding them, helping them, soothing them, is God begins to prune. You don't need that anymore. Oh, that's just dead wood. <laughs> Oh, that seems to be an area of flourishing, but there's just no fruit. I mean, they have to start actually um, allowing the Father. If, I said yesterday, Jesus maybe was, uh, his expertise as a carpenter maybe was shaping yokes. Well, we know for sure his expertise as a pruner is he knows exactly where to make the cut. <laughs> Jesus begins this deep work, and you wouldn't believe the tears that start to flow as the pain comes to the surface, but it's a healing pain. And something happens, it, it usually in both years it's happened after Christmas, is it tips and suddenly it is joy all over the place. It's a strange thing that in the Father's home, we are become so safe that we actually can start to face the pain in our life in a way that he brings a kind of a painful experience of pruning, but it's not the pain of trauma, it's the pain of healing. We, we actually have developed a little saying in our ministry, New Story Community, the women come to us, um, they've not been safe, and so they have become vulnerable. They've been made vulnerable, Vulnerability has been forced on them, so they become guarded. <laughs> and what we see is once they know they're safe, they know they're in the Father's house, and the Father only intends for them good, once they know they're safe, they choose to be vulnerable. And in the choosing of that vulnerability in the place of safety, the healing starts. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Jesus says it over and over. I, wanna, I want you to come in. <laughs> I want you to come and then I want you to come in and then I want you to stay. And I want you to know this is such a place of a love, love, love. Do you hear how many times Jesus says love, love, love? I want you to come in and I want you to know how deeply, deeply loved you are, not because of anything you've done, because you're my kid. And then that thing that is no longer doing you any favors. I'm gonna take a pruning shirt and it'll seem like the most painful thing, it'll be the most healing thing. Some of you need this word today and I'm not talking because you, maybe you're struggling with an addiction of some kind, but just, because you've been hanging on to some pain. It's been so central to your identity. And it's gonna take a different kind of pain. The pain of being safe and to choose vulnerability for God to actually take it out of you. <laughs> and that's the first thing, the, the house is this place of of pain, but it's healing. Second thing is, um, it's a place of extraordinary joy, like just uproarious joy. Uh, that's what comes. Jesus says, my, I want my joy to be in you. Can you imagine the very joy of Jesus in me? <laughs> um, every, virtually every church father, so, you know, this era in church history where these very smart people um, live and soak in scripture and think all the time about it. Virtually every church father notices something about uh, this passage um, that it's not any kind of fruit. It's not apples or pears or plums or 
It's grapes and not any kind of grapes. It's wine grapes. And some of them make a weird sort of uh, uh, application out of that, you know, that um, I won't go into it, but they're, they're, they tend to go to allegory. But um, I like best a, a, a Persian father by the name of Theophilus of Alexandria. Of course, you needed to know that. Theophilus of Alexandria says uh, the, the kind of wine we're talking about isn't the kind of wine you get drunk on and you sort of sit in the corner and, uh, you know, and drink it out of a paper bag or a bottle. You get what I mean. Um, he, he says the kind of wine we're talking about is a wine that you bring out. It's, it's the best wine. It's the wine you bring out for weddings, <laughs> for, for gatherings, for great festivity. Um, and so he connects the wine of festivity with the joy that this passage talks about. And it's true, isn't it? When we actually abide in the Father, we, we stay here, we realize he has no three-day rule. He means for us to stay and stay and stay forever. He, do, do you love the phrase, at home? I was just some friends just before coming here and they said, make yourself at home. And I, it's, there's those kind of friends that I actually, it's true. <laughs> I open the fridge, I don't ask, can I go in the fridge? Uh, but I, I also observe the three-day rule with them. I, I, I don't, they don't make me feel it, I just feel it. I grew up with that. God would be alarmed if he wanted to leave. <laughs> he means for you to stay. And this place of staying, finally even uh, through, in, during this pain of pruning, there's this festivity, it's a house of festivity. It's a house, so much of the laughter in our world is a laughter at the expense of somebody. It's mocking, it's sarcastic. The laughter of heaven is the laughter of pure mirth. It's just belly laughing. <laughs> the, the house of God is a place of laughter. New Story community, um, what begins to happen, especially after the women know they're safe? I have never, ever, ever laughed so hard about nothing and anything. It, by the way, if you don't know an indigenous people, you, you don't even know what laughter is. I'm just sorry, but you don't. <laughs> and just about anything and nothing, everything becomes uproariously, joyfully. It's almost like we're a little intoxicated, but in the right way. Everything's funny. But last thing that I want to notice about this passage, uh, there's this, this pain that is not a pain of trauma, but the pain of healing. There's this, um, this deep, deep joy. You will... If you stay here, Jesus says, if you stay here, you will bear much fruit. Now we could do a whole tracing through of uh, what fruit means biblically. Let me just, just cut to the chase here. I think we don't have to do all of this, you know, the fruit of righteousness and the fruit of the spirit. Those are all good things. I think what Jesus is saying is you will become so amazingly creative It'll be an Acts 2 thing for you. If you actually live in me and let my love flow into you, my joy abound in you, let me do the healing kind of pruning in you that takes away things you don't need anymore. The other side of it is going to be an Acts 2 dreaming of dreams and seeing of visions. You will become a furnace of creativity. You know, everybody on earth has a need to create because we're made in the image of the creator. And often we get into jobs that um, stifle the creativity. Or we grew up in homes that stifle the creativity. The artist in you wasn't encouraged, maybe even mocked. And we just buckle down and we put our nose to the grindstone and we just get our work done. But something is withering up in us because those made in the image of a creator want to create. We want to make beautiful things. I, I, I've just, I have some property up in the North Okanagan and um, 
I better be careful because I could just go crazy talking about this. I got to blow up 100 tons of granite. Yeah, they, they let me push the button. I have never felt so powerful in my life. I just, uh, you know, I didn't do anything other than push the button and kaboom and all this stuff. But what a mess I had. I had like, it looked like the, looked like the Frank slide or the Hope slide, you know, in my driveway. And I had one day that had hired an excavator to get that mess cleaned up. I've known this guy for a little bit, beautiful man, Christian man, Raymond. I said, Raymond, um, do you think we can get this, this sorted out? <laughs> This mound of 100 tons of granite. I mean, some of these rocks are, you know, five tons themselves. Do you think we could get sort out? He says, I have, I have just today. I'm like, I'm fretting. By the end of the day, I have like a piece of art. He is so good with what he does with that great big, great big excavator. And I said, um, Raymond, you're an artist. And he's very shy. He's very humble. He goes, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Like he loves his job because actually he's making art. <laughs> Sometimes our jobs don't allow for that, but do find some place that you can make your art. And it doesn't have to be poetry or painting. You, you have this longing for creativity in here. Um, Ken knows the neuroscientist Kurt Thompson and uh, in his book, The Soul of Desire, he says, uh, Kurt Thompson says, everybody needs to be seen and safe and soothed when, when painful things come in, they need to know it's going to be okay. And he says, once they know they're seen, safe, and soothed, they're in the Father's house, then they start to take risks. And tonight we'll talk a, a little bit more of that risk taking. But sometimes he just says, You want to make things of beauty. And the, and the lovely thing is, it's actually a sign that you're dwelling in the Father's house that, that creativity starts to. Emerge. Let me, let me just tell you about one of our women and then I'll wrap it up. Uh, one of the women that came this year to New Story Community was probably the most traumatized person I've ever met, and that's saying a lot. She carried so much trauma in her body that um, sometimes, especially when we're studying the Bible, uh, her whole body would just, like actually physically, she'd close up and cramp up and she'd bend over in pain. It was triggering something. As time went on, she, she realized she was in a safe place and she, she began to feel the healing, healing work of God in her life. Um, and she started to paint. The first paintings are stuff like maybe your, your preschooler brought home, if you have a kid. And then a, little, a couple weeks later, there may be like somebody, your kid in grade three brought home. Seven months later, she was selling her paintings. And I went into many homes with people who had bought them, and they had taken down other paintings and put them in prominent places, and there was no patriot, patronizing in it. They, these were actually gorgeous paintings that somehow you felt the presence of God standing in the presence of. And I watched this whole cycle of this amazing woman who had been so hurt, carried so much trauma, live in this place of safety. God had to cut so much. It was so painful. She cried the most. <laughs> to this place of now, I can just hear her laughter ringing in my head. And I can see so many of these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful paintings. That The creativity woke up. For several years now, I've been uh, researching and writing a book about a little French village near the Alps, a tiny little village of about 900 people. And uh, during World War II, when the dark shadow of the Third Reich fell across all of Europe, and uh, Europe became, uh, France became more and more occupied by the Nazi presence. This little village of 900 people decided that they were going to shelter Jews. 
the Christian people, a Protestant group led by um, Andre Trockme, Pastor Andre Trockme. And they decided that they were going to risk their lives and say, um, not just welcome to people that nobody wanted and everybody to even shelter them was an, an act of treason, but come, come and stay. <laughs> no three-day rule here. It's one of the most extraordinary stories in history. It only started emerging in the last uh, 20, 30 years, the story of, it's called Le Chambon Sulignon, the little community. I've gone and um, spent much time there. Uh, if you want to console me later about having to go to little villages in France, um, I'll be available. I uh, researched a story, this, the book's almost written, called Shelter Me. But the whole thing of uh, this, community from the start of the war knew what was going to go on, knew that they had to do something, and chose to take this risky thing of sheltering the people in Europe that nobody wanted. It all started not with Andre Trochme, but his wife Magda. A scrawny, hungry, terrified woman by the name of Jean Berthe, Jewish woman, showed up one cold February night in Le Chambon and knocked on the door of the presbytery where the Trochmes lived. This woman, Jean Bate, was, was um, hardly had any, she was shivering. She, she just had a little shawl over her thin clothes. Magda opened the door and Magda said these words. Oh, come in. <laughs> Oh yes, please, 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 come in. And Jean Berthe came in and never left. <laughs> she became part of the family. She and over 2,500 other Jewish people were rescued by this little village of people who so abided in the house of the Father that they became the house of the Father. Would you hear the Father and his son say to you, come in, come in, oh yes, please, 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 come in. I will 
Communion servers come and prepare the table. On the evening before he was betrayed, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples. On the evening before he would be separated from his disciples by the cross and the crucifixion, he would leave them for three days, he shared a meal with them. And during that meal, he took the bread. And he broke it. And he gave thanks. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body broken for each of you. And later in the same meal, he took the cup. And again, he gave thanks. He said, This is the cup of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. 
Whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Every week, he provides a way for us to come, don't we? We come with hands open, expecting something to happen. Not just asking for bread and juice, but asking for the very presence of God. This is the same Jesus who says, I don't leave you as orphans. Because the God who invites us to come invites us to stay in him. Rooted in him. Closer than the relationship between a vine and its branches is a relationship between us and God. The same God invites us to come and to stay in him. So in a moment, I'm going to invite you to come down to one of these communion tables at front and come with your hands open, expecting. Receiving the invitation from God, come and stay in me. Our servers up front are wearing gloves and they'll take a piece of bread, they'll tear it from the loaf, they'll dip it in the cup for you place it in your hands for you. You can take it there. If you want to go back to your seat, you can eat it there as well. And if you're at home, when I invite everyone to come, you can do the same. You can take your cup and your juice and eat them there. You can come forward down the two center aisles and then go back to your seats around the two outer aisles. And if you want to come forward and you want to, or the two outer aisles, thank you. <laughs> if you want to come forward, but maybe you're not ready to receive communion yet, the Father still invites you to come. So come with your arms crossed. Someone from our communion team will pray a prayer of blessing over you. You don't need to come in any order. You can just come. Come and stay. Or in Jesus' own words, abide in him. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you invite us not only to come and to stay in you. And that in communion we have this tangible, touchable, tasteable way that we can be reminded of your great love for us and that you don't leave us. So Lord Jesus, may we not only feel your invitation to come, but our deep need to stay in you. Amen. Come.
Let's dance together We're clearing off the surface You're coming into focus We're going back to the basics The glory of your faces The reason why we do this, Jesus The winds of worship blow the door of heaven open Oh, Jesus at the center Lord, help us to remember The reason why we do this Yeah, it's all about you Jesus, all about you Always has been, always will joined us online. We're so grateful you could come and worship with us today. If you're here in person, we get to keep moving. We get to keep going, keep worshiping, keep playing together. And we're going to send you into your breakout groups right after this. So either meet your breakout group if you have a place to meet with them already, go and meet with them. Otherwise, you can meet them by your number, rally together, and then go out and work through the questions that are in your booklets. You're going to be in those breakout groups until lunch, which is at noon. I invite you now to extend your hands in a posture of receiving today's benediction blessing. The words of Jesus from John 15. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain, stay in my love. So go this week in the great love of the Father, receiving his invitation to come to him, to stay. 
There's no three-day rule in the house of God. So get comfortable. Go this week experiencing the great love and adoration, sensing his invitation to stay. Amen. Go in peace.